Got us over here of a guy named Joffrey Chaucer. Chaucer. Yes. Chaucer. Yes. Wrote and a little. His, uh, wrote a little thing little called son. the Canterbury Tales. Yeah. 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 Well, what a lot of people don't realize is that he wrote probably the first technical writing in the English language. And he did it for a little boy by the name of Lewis to teach him how to use this device, an astrolabe. And uh, Lewis was 10 years old. His Latin wasn't quite good enough to do this all in Latin. So he wrote it in Middle English so that it was more understandable to him. And they say it is the first um, technical writing done in the English language. Now, I don't know whether or not Lewis was actually his son or the son of a friend of his uh, that he just called son, like you, you'd call a young boy's son. And uh, he was 10 years old when this was done. And uh, Chaucer wanted to go ahead and give him a complete um, textbook, so to say, on the use of an astrolabe. And it was supposed to be in five parts. The first part was just the parts of the astrolabe, and that's what I want to go over today. Part two was the practical uses of the astrolabe uh, to include finding your cardinal directions, the time, etc. Uh, part three was uh, the reference section of the, the work where he was going to give the latitude and longitude of various cities and planetary information, etc. Third, uh, the fourth part was the motion of celestial bodies, and the fifth part was the astrological aspects of the astrolabe. And part one is completed. Uh, part two is nearly completed, but he stopped in mid-sentence on one of the last sentences of, the, of the, um, the section, and then part three, four, and five were never written. And the reason that they think that that occurred was that Lewis was the son of a friend of his, who died uh, while he was writing this. And he just literally stopped just as soon as the child died. But this is an astrolabe. And this is the front part of the astrolabe. It's got a movable ruler right here. This is called an adelaide. And this is the ret. And in the back, uh, you have something called the climate. But we're gonna start on the other side. Now, this is what's called a universal astrolabe. And what this does right here is you set this to your latitude and then you use this ruler here or cursor to very accurately denote your time. But we're not going to use this one today. What we're going to do is we're going to use what we built the other day. All right. So the first thing that we have right here, this is called the Adelaide. The Alidade, excuse me, A L. I-D-A-D-E. -E. And what it is is basically a marking ruler. You see it's got it's got a flat edge. And then it's got a, it's got another flat edge. But these two edges right here line up with each other and they also line up with these sights. Now you see there's a little notch in the sight and there's also a hole in the sight. And in the front you have the same thing. This part right here is called the ring and you hang this from your thumb. And it attaches to something called the throne. And this is the body of the astrolabe. Now, going from the horizon here at zero up to 90 degrees, this is denoted in degrees from 90 down to zero. And the purpose of those, and it does it on both sides, and the purpose of that is so that you can sight to a celestial object or the top of a building or something else through these sights. And then you can literally read off the angle right up here. So, for example, right there is about 45 degrees. All right. So this is an angle measuring device right here. The bottom part down here is called the shadow box. And this is used to measure down uh, into holes or up to the top of buildings. And it's got a scale on it that you can actually pace off the distance between the building and yourself. And then once you know that distance, the scale down here will tell you what percentage of that distance the height of the building represents. So for example, it may be one third of the distance, the height of the building may be one third the distance 
than it is to the building. So at 45 degrees, which would be this mark right here or that one, the height of a building would be the same distance as it would be to walk to the building. So, you know, that's the old flagpole. How high is the flagpole test that we all did in grade school? Now, just inside the angle scale, you have the zodiacal calendar. And it starts up here. This, is, this would be the summer solstice or the June solstice. So we go with Cancer, Leo, Virgo, Libra. Scorpio, Sagittarius, Capricorn, Aquarius, Pisces, Aries, Taurus, and Gemini. Now, each of these zodiacal signs has got 30 degrees assigned to it. And that 30 degrees is directly underneath where these angle marks are. So, for example, this is the first day of Gemini, or the first degree, or the zero degree of Gemini. That would be the 30 degree of Gemini. Okay? Underneath it, we have our standard calendar. So we can tell a couple of things right off the bat. So for example, if we bring this up, 90 degrees. All right, 90 degrees will be the first of Cancer, and that is the summer or the June solstice. Then as we come down, we come to the first of Libra and the first of Aries at zero degrees, and these are the equinox dates. Now, you can tell the dates on this by reading inward on the date scale. So, the summer solstice or the June solstice looks like it's June 21st. Then we have an equinox on September 23rd. We have a December solstice on December 21st. And then on March 21st or so, would be the, the spring or the March equinox. All right. Now there's more scales in here, but basically the reason I wanted to start on the back here is just to kind of go over the fact that this is how you find your angle to a celestial body. For example, the sun. And so you mark the angle of, uh, you mark the angle to the sun, and then you actually have to translate the date. So for example, today is what, the 24th of January? So the 24th of January, looks like we're in Aquarius and we're on the fifth day of Aquarius. That'll become important when we go to the other side. Now, there's a nut right here and then there's an axle that goes all the way through the astrolabe and then we come over to the other side, okay? And that nut comes right through here and it'll secure with a pin that's sometimes called the horse. But this axle allows all these other things to rotate on it. Now on this side, what we have is 360 degrees on the outside. All right, and they go all the way around, 360 degrees. Now, on the base right in here, now this is all called the matta, or the mother. This hollowed out cavity right in here is called the womb of the astrolabe. And in it is something called the climate, which is a, a what do they call that thing, a planisphere? You know, like the old star, star finders. So if you look at this, you'll see that there's a line that goes right through here. This is your horizon line, and this is looking south. Right here in the middle, this center dot right here is called your zenith. These, these climates are made specifically for latitudes. This one is made for about latitude 44 or so. And you can tell what the climate is made for. Let's see, we're gonna try and get in here a little closer. But right here, you'll see, uh, where'd it go? This one right here. This line that you can see right here, can you see that coming through? That is the Tropic of Cancer. Now, above it, on a second line, which you can see a little bit of right here, and it's got these Roman numerals on it, this is the equator line. So if you go from the zenith up to the equator, you can see where the astrolabe is designed to be used. And as you see right here, this is your zenith. That's 80. That's 60 degrees. 
that's 40 degrees. This middle line right here is 45, and the equator line goes through at about latitude 43, which is what this astro wave is set up to do. And we've got some other lines on here that are important as well. But this darker piece right here is called the ret. Now, ret in Latin means uh, net. In Arabic, they use the term spider for this. And what you can do with this is actually kind of interesting because say you have a star that you want to look at, like Vega, which is located right here. Vega would be at the tip of this little pointer. And by going over to the other side and getting the altitude to Vega, you can then use these, uh, these altitude lines. Let's see, there's a name for these. Almacanters, okay? And they start here at the horizon. Then it goes up to 20 degrees, 40 degrees, looks like 60 and 80 degrees. And the top one right here is 80 degrees. And then the center, of course, is 90. So Deneb would be very near your zenith at 43 degrees north latitude when the, when the astro wave is in this position. If you measure Vega and it comes out to 40 degrees above the horizon, what you can do is actually bring that tip right down to the 40 degree line at Vega. Then this is called the ecliptic. And what you do with this is you find the date on the ecliptic. So we said today was the 5th of Aquarius. So what we're going to do is we're going to bring our ruler, or a label they call it, over to the 5th day of Aquarius, which would be right here. And Vega will be at that position at 2.30 in the afternoon. So that's one way that you can tell time with this. So let's go ahead and uh, do a quick example here. Now I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to get, I'm going to bring up Stellarium. And this will be for Alma, Michigan, which is about 41, 42 degrees north. So it'll be slightly off of what we have here. Well, in any event, right up here, uh, I've selected the sun. And right up here, we've got the celestial data on the sun. All right. And right here, you're going to see the azimuth and altitude of the sun. And the altitude of the sun is 25 degrees, 22 minutes right now. So let's go back here to the astrolabe. What we're going to do is the ecliptic will tell you where the sun is. So today is the fifth day of Aquarius. And we want to line that up with the altitude ring that corresponds to 25 degrees. So right here is the fifth day of Aquarius. Okay, That would be located right there. Right there. So what we're going to do is we're going to bring this up. Now the fifth day of Aquarius is on just below 20 degrees. And we want to go to 25 degrees, which is going to be about right there. Maybe just a hair more. Then we bring our ruler around and we line it up with the fifth day of Aquarius and we can read off the time. Now the time right here, this is 12, this is 12 o'clock noon. Now, what are we reading here? We're reading solar time. Uh, the time on the clock is not solar time. That's civil time. And solar time is, 12 noon solar time is when the sun is 180 degrees to our south. And it's, high, and it's at its zenith of its, um, of its path through the sky during the day. Now, the interesting thing that you can think about with that is what is civil time derived from? If it was 12 noon at Greenwich England. All right. That is the prime meridian and that would be solar noon at, um, at Greenwich. Now, one hour later, one o'clock Greenwich time, it will be at solar noon, 15 degrees to the west. So the time zone for Greenwich is the Greenwich meridian plus seven and a half degrees either way. And that abuts up 
to the center of the next time zone, which is located at 15 degrees west, and that goes seven and a half degrees either way, and it butts up with Greenwich time and the one to the west as well. Well, my time zone here in the United States is Eastern Standard Time right now. The center of my time zone is 75 degrees west longitude, which is approximately the longitude of Albany, New York. All right. I am at 84 degrees west longitude or 9 degrees west of the center of my time zone. Am I in the correct time zone? No, I'm really not. I really should be in the central time zone, okay? Because my location is about right here. And as you see, south of me is central time. Strictly looking at solar time and uh, longitude is not the way we determine time zones. So most of Michigan to the middle of Lake Michigan is in the eastern time zone. There are some areas in northern Michigan uh, in the upper peninsula that are in the central time zone. And that would include, this is drawn incorrectly because the time zone actually goes through here and then goes out to about where this little bump is, not the peninsula, but east of the peninsula. So this is all central time zone over here. And why is it central time zone? Well, because this is all Eastern and we're really pushing into the central time zone. And I guess they just said, well, enough's enough. And again, a lot of these areas right in here deal primarily with Wisconsin, and it's beneficial to have everybody on the same clock, okay? So, as a result, my time here, my solar noon will be considerably later than the solar noon out here in Albany, New York, which is the center of the time zone that I'm in. How much so? Well, let's go ahead and have a look at Alma, Michigan, which is due south of me. Solar noon in Alma, Michigan is 12.50. In other words, 50 minutes past solar noon in Albany. Now, there are two things that cause this. One is the difference in longitude. Okay, that's going to add something like 36 minutes to my time. So when it's solar noon in Albany, it'll be solar noon 36 minutes later here. Well, where are the other 14 minutes coming from? Well, there's a thing called the equation of time. And that is what's responsible for the solar analemma. As the Earth moves in its orbit around the Sun, there are times that it's further away or closer to the Sun. Right now we're at a period of time where we're at our closest to the Sun. That was probably right around the winter or December solstice. And then uh, as we go into summer, we move away from the Sun. We're further from it. As we move away, our orbital speed and the, and the angular speed that we go through our orbit slows down. As we get closer to the sun, it speeds up. That's Kepler's, that's Kepler's law of planetary motion. And as a result, if you look at Greenwich, England right now, solar noon there is probably on the order of 12, 10 p.m. And that 10 or 15 minute delay afternoon is due to the equation of time. So you have to take that into account when you tell time. Now the other thing that you can do is you can try and figure out what time's dawn going to be. So what I did was I, I came over here. I've got the fifth day of Aquarius right here. And I'm on the horizon line, which is this dark line right here. We're going to line that up. This will be the position of the sun on this date. Now to find out what time that is, what we have to do is we have to come on over here and it looks like it's about comes out to 708 right here see there's seven o'clock each one of these little braids is 10 minutes and we're just shy of the first braid that'll give us 708 add 50 minutes to that you're getting 758 which is only four minutes at um, four minutes off of the actual time so this one is a little bit more accurate than the wood one all right, so any questions so far? Kind of a cool little device, isn't it?
too deep for me. 